company car sales, as everyone knows, are good for vehicle makers and franchise dealers, but they're also a shot in the arm for staff morale. And they provide enormous financial benefits to the lucky employees who get the perk. In a fairly stereotypical company, the office junior gets him or herself a Vauxhall Nova. The salesman out in the field has a 1.4 LX Escort. His boss back at base has a Cavalier, perhaps with a few choice extras. And just to remind them who they're all working for, the big cheese gets himself a Rover Sterling. The company car has become an expectation in an increasingly broad range of jobs. So why has it entered so deeply into the national psychology? I think it provides uh, a status differential uh, within an organisation. It's also a very tax-effective benefit. As a status differential, of course, it uh, shows not only to your colleagues at work, but also to your family and friends what your status is. It may show people perhaps that uh, uh, you are slightly more upmarket than they are, so it's today's equivalent of the epaulette. It's easy to see why employees lap up the cars. Currently, the driver of a 1.6-litre Cavalier doing more than 2,500 business miles a year and whose petrol bills are paid for by the company will be taxed as though the benefits are equivalent to an extra £2,800 in salary. That means just £700 a year in tax but it actually costs nearly £5,000 a year to run a Cavalier GL. So the Chancellor needs to tax company cars much more heavily to stop them being a bargain. But the tax system can hit those who actually need their cars for work. Service engineers, for example, doing up to 18,000 genuine business miles a year, still have to pay tax on car use, even if their private mileage is very low and the Inland Revenue is pursuing all sorts of other groups for tax too. You can see the effect of Britain's company car culture in the showroom. Most employees choose their company car from a list of vehicles within a specified price band. They're called user choosers. Now manufacturers, knowing that the odd hundred pounds here or there isn't going to make that much difference, are keen to woo this particular breed and to do that, they load the cars up with all sorts of profitable goodies. Take the 405, for example, all but the base models in Britain come with an electric sunshine roof as standard. In France, the 605 doesn't even come with a stereo. And the same pattern's true for Ford, Vauxhall, Rover and just about everyone else in the fleet market. In Britain, the average car park has a higher proportion of bigger cars than anywhere else in Europe, with the inevitable exception of Germany. Even in America, there's been a trend toward more compact business vehicles, encouraged by company economy measures. But over here, status-conscious employees are wooed by larger cars so they can appear to retain a superior position in the company hierarchy. So the British market is full of very highly specified cars and has an inflated demand for relatively large ones. All this helps drive up list prices we're all asked to pay. But after pushing up the prices with all the goodies, the fleet's demand discounts of up to 30%. Now, the private buyer can't hope to match these special deals, even with a good trade-in. So British consumers probably end up paying more for their cars than they would on the continent. There are also suggestions that the company car market influences garage bills. Servicing costs in franchise dealers, where the majority of customers are business drivers, are higher and tend to be geared to what the company market will pay. And since his employer is footing the bill, the company car driver is thought to be more tolerant of accepting unnecessary replacement items. Again, the price to the ordinary motorist is dictated by the company car. If you pay for them yourself, you control the cost very much. You're trying to minimise the cost. If somebody else is paying, then you tend not to worry about the cost so much. And companies subsidised, whatever, do tend to be far more expensive. The same goes for petrol. Company car drivers often have their fuel paid for, and oil companies admit they're more likely to choose the station according to the free gifts on offer. The private motorist is possibly more influenced by price. And what about environmental damage? Company cars have larger engines and are less fuel efficient as a result. They're said to chuck out 15 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, and that sure has an effect on global warming. Now, company car drivers not only buy a bigger car than they would if they were buying one themselves, but also choose the largest possible engine that their tax bracket allows. 
And then on top of all that, they drive them as much as possible to make up the mileage for their tax benefit. And against that sort of background, what possible hope does public transport or car sharing have? And is there an effect on driving standards? If I were a company car driver, would I be more likely to indulge in socially irresponsible or even illegal behaviour? Yeah, well, super salesman, that's me. Yeah, hold on a minute. Will you get out of the way? Do company car drivers who don't have to pay for things like no claims bonuses drive as well as the rest of us? According to a recent survey, business drivers are more likely to break the law. Almost half of company car drivers thought it acceptable to drive at 90 miles an hour on motorways, compared with a quarter of ordinary drivers. Twice as many business drivers admitted driving too close. And according to the survey, they're also more likely to drink and drive on a regular basis. So what's the future of company cars? Let's face it, it's a habit that's going to be pretty hard to break. They're an essential ingredient in modern day business, they keep employees happy, and they're good for jobs in the car industry. Most observers believe there's going to be little negative effect in the budget, but that remains to be seen. One South London council, however, is doing its bit. They're offering 10 pence per mile as a bike allowance. Very environmentally sound, I'm sure, but on a day like today, they have got to be joking. Much to everyone's surprise, in 1975, the XJS replaced the E-Type Jaguar. With its hard top, its automatic gearbox and its near-silent engine, it was not a sports car then, and it's not a sports car now. There have been various derivations since 75, convertibles, a six-cylinder option, and most recently a thundering but nearly undrivable six-litre. But through oil crises, privatisation, the V12 Coupe has soldiered on. Now I know it's 15 feet long and the cabin's only this big, but when you're sitting here cocooned by this huge transmission tunnel, titchy little windows running round, it feels like you're in your own little oldie worldy nest. There are bits of the dashboard I'm not too fond of. The instrument binnacle looks like an awful hangover from the 70s, though I'm told it's to be replaced soon. And the last time I saw a knob like that, it was on a 1955 oven. Overall, though, it does have the charm of a lovely English country cottage. The wood looks like it's meant to be there. The leather feels right. A lot of manufacturers simply nail wood onto their most expensive models to make them different from the Acrylan and plastic ones further down the range. That never works. It can never look as good as this. I just love it. The engine's old, too, fashioned from cast iron and so fabulously heavy, it's still a superb means of propulsion. And then there's the buttress styling. It was heavily criticised, but today, when all cars look the same, this is a refreshing change. And anyway, I've always rather liked it. It was always intended to be an effortless Grand Tourer. Indeed, in town, it can be persuaded to do nine MPG. You can buy more power, more sophistication, and a lot more fuel economy. But no car will do a thousand miles of German autobahn and a trip through the Alps in one day with such a plot. You simply engage Waftmatic on the automatic gearbox, sit back and just watch the world go by. There's no doubt that a replacement for the XJS would be lighter, faster and more spacious. But would it be better? Probably not. One car that isn't wearing so well as this old Leviathan is Volvo's even older 240. Now this can trace its roots back to a time when Harold Wilson was Prime Minister, when England won the World Cup, and when Rod Stewart was going out on his first date. It sells now only because of Volvo's image. It's perceived to be as safe and as sturdy as a Gloucestershire cottage, or a mansion in the case of the estate. Well, 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 it seems to be true. All Cotswolds antique dealers do have Volvos. The thing is, every year Volvo makes some changes to their version of perpetual motion. This year I've got a bigger back window. This policy of evolution, rather than revolution, has resulted in it becoming quite a good value for money package. It now has power steering and central locking provided as standard, for instance. It also means that when a customer goes into the showroom for a new car, they're not just getting a newer one, they're actually getting a better one. It's not quite as spacious in here as you might imagine. A Montego is just as commodious. And frankly, I find the whole thing a bit on the austere side. Dynamically, the Volvo 240 feels like it's a product of the 60s. 
With its rough engine and its live rear axle, it's only really happy at very slow speeds. Push it and the whole thing becomes coarse and a trifle wayward. Few, however, will push it. It's rather like a barber jacket, this. Hardly the most fashionable garment you can buy, but Duriger nevertheless for the country set. It's nothing short of mind-blowing that this car was launched to compete with the Austin Cambridge, yet in 1990 it will outsell that technocrat, the Citroen XM. It can do that not only because of its image, but also because it's comparatively cheap. But a car doesn't have to be old-fashioned just because it's old. The original Audi Quattro is now 10, and it's every bit as fast and vibrant and exciting and expensive as it ever was. Designed originally to win rallies, it was the first performance car that successfully mated a powerful engine to full-time four-wheel drive. There have been more successful rally cars, but none has made such an impact. It really did change the face of rallying. Audi pulled out of the sport four years ago, and when they launched the new range of 80s, 90s and coupes, a lot of people thought the proper Quattro had died. Wrong. Truth be told, it nearly did. But such was the strength of feeling, particularly in Britain, that the venerable old warhorse was awarded a stay of execution. Better than that, Audi are still developing it. It's powered now by a 220 horsepower, 20 valve engine, turbocharged, intercooled, 2.3 litres, five cylinders. Even with a catalytic converter, it still manages to get from 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds. But there's an awful lot more to it than that. The original four-wheel drive mechanicals, which split power evenly between the front and rear axles, have been replaced by a far more sophisticated system, which sends power to whichever axle sensors say is best able to handle it. The electronics extend inside with a gaudy instrument binnacle that I don't think is in keeping with a sensible four-seater supercar like this one. Then there's a facility for turning the anti-lock brakes off, Apparently the car stops quicker on snow without ABS. If you want to keep going on snow, there's an electronically lockable differential. However, its use is somewhat negated by fast tyres, which work superbly well in normal conditions, but are quite useless in snow. They're just too wide. The Quattro may have earned its reputation in conditions like these, but the latest version is a real handful. You should have heard my language while we were filming this. Even so, the Quattro has yet to be beaten by any of the imitators which have come along in the past decade. None of them. Indeed, no car covers ground so quickly and so safely. And the same applies even when it's pouring with rain. Even Audi's own attempt to topple it with the new S2 have, by all accounts, failed. Now, in this job, I'm forever being asked a question. Given all the money in the world, what car would I buy? You're looking at it. This all-new car has to muscle in on Europe's most fiercely competitive sector. And it isn't going to beat the Escort and the Golf if half the people that take a test drive are frightened away by its strange idiosyncrasies. Citroen themselves say that they don't have a responsibility to make quirky cars that don't sell. They point to the DS's total sales figure in its 25-year life of 1.4 million. They need to sell that many ZXs in 25 months. So it's bye-bye hydro-pneumatic suspension, bye-bye crazy instruments, hello the grey suit. However, having been forced to make a conventional car, they've decided on a very unconventional marketing approach. Now sure, some are cheaper than others, but each is designed to appeal to different people. I think we should have shot this on a catwalk. There's the reflex. This is aimed at the young, trendy, perhaps female buyer. It's got colour-coded bumpers, natty side stripes and terrific yellow pinstriped upholstery. And then there's the Avantage. Now this has the same 1.4 litre engine as the Reflex, but it's aimed at an altogether more serious family man. No flamboyant colour-coded bumpers here. It's even got side rubbing strips. For the family man after a bit more in the way of luxury, there's the 1.6 litre fuel-injected Aura. And then there's the one that I'd like to have a go in, the 130 horsepower Volcan. However, I'm told that in the UK, this is going to be the bigger seller. So this is the one I'm going to go and drive. Mm -hmm. 
Not only did we eschew the Volcan, but we did the decent thing and scarred the south of France for some typically British weather. Now this engine's terrific. Basically it's the same unit you get in a Peugeot 205 GTI. Although it has low gearing for good acceleration, it isn't even very noisy. My only beef is that a catalytic converter is relegated to the options list. However, the engine is not the best bit of the car. That accolade is reserved for the suspension. The ride is as close to faultless as you can get, but this does nothing to hurt the handling. Citroen have invented a new type of rear axle which helps here, allowing the rear wheels to steer in tandem with those at the front. This is probably the best chassis you can get in a small car. If it weren't for this badge here, I'd have an awful job believing this was a Citroen. It's all so normal. Proper dials, proper knobs, a two-spoke steering wheel. It even appears to be well made as well, though having said that, this seat belt mounting broke earlier on today and that's not good news. However, normalness doesn't mean it's bereft of clever touches. The stereo is of a type that would be useless in any other car, so there's no point stealing it. And the heating and ventilation system, joy of joys, is able to provide cold air to the face and warm air to the feet at the same time. Basically, this is a very well thought out, comfortable and spacious cockpit. Citroen fans will probably kill me for saying this, but I think this is one of the best interiors they've ever done. It's the little things. You can close the electric windows even after you've turned the engine off, and that's got to be sensible if you're forgetful like me. Now, the back all looks completely normal, but believe me, these seats are very wacky. Not only do the backrests recline, but also you can pull the whole thing forwards. If you're carrying a couple of rugby players, of course, you just slide it back. Will this new car sell? Well, providing it's priced properly, and knowing Citroen it will be, the short answer is yes. Plus, of course, it couldn't have come along at a better time. The 309 is old, the Golf and the Astra are due for replacement before the end of the year, and the new Escort badly needs the better engines that are in the pipeline. That realistically leaves the Rover 200, which is a very good car. But believe you me, so is the ZX. So, to sum up, we like the clever seats, the ride and handling are in a class of their own, and the engine's pretty good too. We're less impressed, however, with this styling, and neither catalytic converters nor anti-lock brakes are standard. It does run on unleaded petrol, though.